And at Hopkins, we certainly recognized uh, this uh, very problem. And uh, given the limited resources that we have, and uh, the dwindling um, NIH budget, we have to sort of make use of limited resources. The question is how we can shortcut this process and make a discovery at the bench that can actually have a clinical impact. So we turned our attention to, in fact, existing drugs. The idea is that if we could discover a known drug that has unexpected novel pharmacologic activity, we can bypass all the early time-consuming and um, sort of uh, expensive uh, process and to translate this discovery directly to a phase two clinical trial. This will not only reduce the cost and the time to develop a drug, but also it can speed up the translation of these discoveries into a real drug in the clinic to benefit patients. <coughs> so based on this idea, we began over uh, uh, 10 years ago at Hopkins to build what I will now we call the Johns Hopkins Drug Library. When we looked at the number of drugs that has been approved by US FDA since 1938, the total number is not that staggering. Uh, by 2003, it's about 34, 64 individual chemical compounds, chemical drugs. Today, this number has reached somewhere between 36 to 3,700. We then began a process of acquiring each one of them, as many of them as possible, and plate them into 96 and 384 wheel plates. I'm going to show you a picture <coughs> of those plates. And once this is done, basically we can interrogate this collection of known drugs to ask a question of which of the drugs may have a desirable potential therapeutic effect on the disease of interest, uh, for which actually we can develop an assay of. So this is a, a snapshot of a subset of the drug library, you can see each of these is a plastic, plastic, 96 well plated. It has 96 holes in them, and then you can basically, for, to each hole, you can place the stock solution of a known drug. And we have uh, a total of close to 40 of these plates to house this Johns Hopkins drug library. And with this library in hand, we decided to do, among other things, to discover inhibitors of angiogenesis. Angiogenesis refers to the physiological process of a new blood vessel formation. It plays a critical role during embryo development. At adulthood, however, angiogenesis uh, play, plays a more limited physiological function. Uh, it's required, for example, uh, in such physiological processes as wound healing, um, pregnancy, uh, menstrual cycle, hair follicle growth. As important uh, as uh, these processes are uh, to a terminally ill cancer patient, for example, they are still largely dispensable. So as such, inhibitors of angiogenesis uh, due to the discovery and the extensive study by Judah Falkman, the pioneer in this field, uh, angiogenesis inhibitors have been sought after as a novel uh, type of cancer therapeutics with relatively no toxicity uh, uh, for patients. And here I'm just uh, depicting uh, uh, the process by which a small growing tumor uh, is actually actively recruiting the growth of new blood vessels. It does so in two different ways. It either secretes protein factors that's going to stimulate new blood vessel growth. It can also recruit and activate immune cells, including mast cells and macrophages, that in turn also facilitate this process. So by induction of new blood vessel growth, the tumor would then feed itself with nutrients and oxygen, and also using this, use the same new blood vessel to get rid of waste product. And this process, of course, is quite complicated. Um, and in vitro, however, we can actually partially replicate this process 
by looking at the proliferation of a single cell type. That is this uh, green um, endothelial cells that form the inner line, innermost layer of all blood vessels. And in fact, it is the growth of these endothelial cells that is the major driving force of angiogenesis. So to inhibit angiogenesis, all we need to do is to find inhibitors of endothelial cells among other cells. So with the drug library in hand, we then screened each of the individual drugs uh, on these cells to look at their effect on cell proliferation. So here the vertical axis is the percent inhibition. So a vertical bar here means the drugs at this given concentration actually inhibited 100% of the endothelial cell proliferation. And these drugs, we've cl uh, the classic, uh, subdivided them according to their classes. As you can see, we actually observed a large number of drugs uh, that inhibited angiogenesis. But among these, there are quite a few surprises. That is, the drugs that has, have never been shown to have any effect on angiogenesis process. And I just want to highlight one of them here, really, which is called itraconazole. This is the capsule of the drug. For those of you who've experienced uh, fungal infection in toenail or for other patients who have systemic fungal infection. And uh, in fact, here is the structure of the drug, chemical structure of the drug. When we looked at the effect of the drug on endothelial cells, here uh, we use human umbilical vein endothelial cell as our sort of cell model system. Uh, we can see this drug actually inhibited the cells very potently. Uh, we are looking at the, what is known as the IC50 value. That is the concentration at which the drug would have inhibited this cell proliferation by 50%. So the lower the number here, the more potent or more active the drug is. So when we look at the Ichikana's effect on HUVAC, you can see it's 160 nanomolar or 0.16 micromolar. In contrast, when we looked at the effect of Ichikana'sol on uh, sort of skin cells or uh, jerk at leukemia cells, in fact, as you can see here, this value is over 100 micromolar. So they barely had, it barely had any effect on those other cells. So this showed really extraordinary selectivity uh, towards endothelial cells. 